Okay, good to see you again, Alex. Good to see you, Eric. Uh, we're on opposite ends of the uh, of the country, it seems. But uh, um, you know, I've known you for a long time, and and uh, I was even a fan of yours before I think uh, we knew each other. But um, what's impressed me is that building green has kind of become the de facto industry standard for for kind of trusted, safe green building knowledge. Uh, would you agree? Well, I'd love to agree. It's great <laughs> to hear that. Uh, we try to play that role, and I think we've we've been doing it a long time. So uh, we should get some points for longevity, if nothing else. Yeah, well, we're both certainly very old. Uh, yeah. What are you uh, um, uh, What are you excited about this year uh, at West Coast Green? Well, you know, at at West Coast Green and Green Build, other conferences I go to, I tend to spend a lot of time in the trade show. I don't know, it's always fun for me to see new stuff that's coming out. Uh, the West Coast Green show tends to have more product innovation than other shows. You know, maybe that's because you're on the West Coast, the sort of hub of innovation in the country, but uh, I'm always finding out about really cool new stuff. So I'll be spending a bunch of time wandering around seeing what's new while I'm out there. It seems like it would be hard to surprise you with anything new though. It seems like that you and you and Nadav would have found everything new that there is to be had already. <laughs> uh, not at all. I'm oh. surprised all the time. Oh wow. Yeah. And then, uh, is there are there any is there anything you're currently just obsessed over? Well, um, yeah, I guess at the moment, and I've, I've written some articles recently that have been critical of polystyrene, mm -hmm. um, you know, the insulation material, both relative to some chemicals that are put in it to prevent fire, the uh, flame retardants. And with extruded polystyrene, the blowing agents that are used to expand the foam, which uh, are very significant greenhouse gases. So when I talk about problems with polystyrene, I'm always told that, well, gee, that's the only thing we can put below grade. Yeah. So I'm obsessed okay. with finding better alternatives for insulation that can be used below grade both to insulate foundation walls and to insulate underneath concrete slabs. So I've been focusing on that and there are some alternatives. They're not widely available but there's some cool new products. So I'm looking into those quite a bit. I, I do a, a weekly product of the week blog that I've done now for the last seven or eight months. Having a lot of fun with that. But uh, this week and next I hope to focus on a couple of those alternatives to polystyrene for below grade use. Do you see, as, as kind of the information comes into building green, do you, do you see them, do they fall into buckets? Are they, do they fall into kind of neat trends or are they just kind of always just all over the place? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of it's all over the place. You know, we tend to get a lot of information coming into the office about product certifications mm -hmm. and the whole certification scene which is you know amazingly complicated and getting more complicated all the time um, you know we also we have a fairly new resource the last year and a half or so called leaduser.com so we get a lot of information that's lead focused uh, most of that goes to Tristan Roberts, uh, one of our editors here, who's responsible for lead user. But um, I don't know. We, you know, a lot of stuff comes in. Uh, most of the product information gets shuffled toward Brent Ehrlich uh, or me. Uh, LCA stuff, life cycle assessment stuff, goes typically to Jennifer Atley who's doing a lot of work on the sort of chemicals, life cycle, and uh, healthy materials issues. But uh, we're, whoops, lost you there. We're uh, yeah. seeing, you know, just a lot of new stuff all the time. So it's, you know, I, I can't say it, I guess it does go in some cycles, but there's always 
a variety coming in the door. But they 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 do tend to copycat sometimes because I remember uh, you guys wrote about the new Toto faucet, uh, or was it the Taco Demand system that generates its own power through the through the water, so it doesn't need mm -hmm. to be wired. And then there was a flood of of kind of imitators from other companies that did it. Same thing with the with the dual flush flush valve. You know, I think Sloan was the first one to market with it, and now right. every company's got it. Do, do you find that happening a lot? Um, yeah, I, I think that happens. You know, I don't. You know, I think that's typical, not just in building products, but you know, throughout our technology world. Yeah. You know, we get Apple coming out with a, an iPhone, and then you know, within six months, there'll be three or four others that uh, have similar functionality. So I think that's pretty common of the manufacturing sector to see something that works from a product innovator and then copy it and tweak it a little bit to get around patent protections, but uh, um, you know, basically try to do the same sort of thing. So. It happens a lot. <clears throat> and and uh, I have a list, I have a running list in my head of building codes that I would want to change that are <laughs> that are a block to uh, to certain green building things uh, that I've tr you know tried to get done in California and I just I'm not allowed. Do you have a list of products that you'd like to see that you wish existed? I mean you mentioned the the EPS uh, for foundations. Do you have like a do you have a long list of other things that you wish somebody would invent? Uh, I do keep a list. And actually, we've talked about doing an article in Environmental Building News sometime of products we'd like to see. Uh, you know, one of those that I've kind of been keeping an eye out for for years is a, a sort of a foamed silicate product or a foamed ceramic product that would be totally mm -hmm. inorganic. Um, basically, I don't know if you're familiar with expanded polystyrene where you get little uh, beads of um, pla polystyrene plastic that are foamed and then stuck together with, uh, with heat. But to do that same sort of thing with an inorganic mineral product, expanding beads and then fusing them together. Oh, yeah. So that you'd have you know, zero risk of flame spread or smoke developed, a totally inorganic product, insulating fairly well fairly well, comparable to expanded polystyrene maybe, or possibly not quite as good, but still reasonable insulation levels, reasonable compressions, compressive strength, and uh, very safe from an indoor air quality standpoint. So that's one product I'd like to see. Yeah, but you guys could almost um, start your own incubator of product innovations and then uh, find some venture capitalists to back it and then just build them yourselves in a way. Although that starts to kind of cross into other territory that you, you don't usually do, but yeah, uh, interesting idea. You know, we <laughs> haven't pursued that. Maybe maybe we should. Maybe it would be more lucrative than selling information. <laughs> yeah, in your free time, you can work on that. Yeah, I, I do get calls fairly often from uh, venture capital companies that are looking for ideas and wanting me wanting to get my take on a new product. It was funny, I did an article, maybe you saw it a oh, couple of years ago on building integrated wind, the idea yeah. of putting wind turbines on top of buildings. And I kind of poo-pooed the idea, you know, for various reasons. And uh, All Things Considered picked up on the topic, and I was interviewed on All Things Considered. And uh, Terry Gross, not Terry Gross, uh, who was it at uh, All Things Considered, uh, blanking on her name. Uh, she did a great interview, a great uh, segment on building integrated wind, and ended it with a quote from me where I said, you know, I'm skeptical about the claims from manufacturers out there today, but if somebody comes up with a better mousetrap, something that really works and is cost effective, I'll be the first to get behind it. And, you know, within a week after that, I got, you know, a probably a dozen emails and calls from companies saying, gee, we've got that better mousetrap. Yeah. And, uh, you know, including I got a call from a venture capital firm pursuing that. And, 
they ended up having me look at a particular product innovation uh, from a company in Singapore that ended up not going anywhere. But you know, I get some of that stuff. So you know, there's clearly interest in in the kind of knowledge we have at Building Green, and um, I'd like to see some of those good ideas get someplace. So we keep providing some input. Well, I think you guys don't realize the power that you have over the industry. I mean, uh, if you if if you and a dog get behind something, it has a lot of impact on us on us kind of uh, followers of yours that that sit and, and you know and, and read the site. And I know it's hard to imagine up there in Vermont, but it's but it's true. I mean, we you know we kind of wait with bated breath to hear your take on things. Uh, so. Think of the I mean, think of the power you could have in, in, in moving us in the right direction. Yeah, that's, that's great. We just actually yesterday published our September issue of EBN Online, and that includes a, an editorial, the EBN take on Fly Ash. And Fly Ash has been in the news quite a bit recently, and EPA is weighing in on how to manage it from a waste standpoint. So I think a lot of people have been coming to us saying, so... What about fly ash? Is it something that's okay to put in concrete? Uh, are we going to end up creating an asbestos problem down the road? So we've given a lot of thought to that. We have a feature article this month that addresses concrete and various additives, strategies for reducing the Portland cement content. Hmm. And then in an editorial, we weighed in on sort of what our position is on fly ash. And we've modified it a little bit. You know, given over the years, uh, or, or from our past position, you know, like a lot in the green building field, we used to think fly ash was great virtually all the time because it kept this uh, waste material out of the waste stream. But uh, concern about leaching of heavy metals from fly ash, you know, has uh, caused us to modify our position somewhat. So we're now only recommending fly ash in applications where two conditions are met. One, it's it's pretty well locked up, as is the case in concrete. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to escape easily into the environment. And two, we're looking for applications where that fly ash reduces carbon emissions by replacing Portland cement. So we used to support fly ash for things like um, uh, just an additive in carpet backing where it's been used and, you know, uh, aggregate materials. We're now, you know, restricting our recommendations of fly ash to applications where those two conditions are met. So anyway, but that's an example of, you know, how we look at a issue and try to impact the industry a little bit. Right. <clears throat> that's fascinating. Um, well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, I, I thank you so much for taking the time for this quick interview, and uh, and I look forward to seeing you guys at West Coast Green at the end of the month. Great. I look forward to being there. Okay. Look thank to you. Seeing you. Thank you so much. Sure thing.